Uh, I'd like to tr introduce the uh, Lauren Anki, who is basically in charge of the Vice President of Development and Public Affairs for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Did I get that correct, Lauren? No. no. Sorry. Education. 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 And public program, sorry. But basically, Dr. Lauren Anki, will you please come up and take over? And her and Dr. Jason Hanley, who is also on the educational staff at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, will be kind of functioning as your lead in and lead out people today. So I can take a break and save my breath for tomorrow night and Friday night, and Saturday night rather. So without further ado, and also we want to uh, let people know, we want to thank a whole lot of uh, Played people besides the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We have uh, a list of sponsors that uh, these people that were important for this. And uh, we'd like to thank Louisiana Travel Service, the Renaissance Arts, Spring Hill Suites, the Mississippi Development Authority, Vision of Tourism, the Naris, Bent Media, who designed all our great graphics for everything, Offbeat Magazine, the Louisiana Music Factory, DBA, and we're going to have a great bunch of food food for you from Cashew Cheeses, Cure, Green Goddess, The Joint, The Link Restaurant Group, which is Herb St. Butcher, and uh, Kushan, all fine restaurants, Midway Pizza, Reginelli, St. Marie, one of the great new restaurant on Poitras that I love, Stein's Deli, a great place, and Zapp's Chips, so they're all going to be feeding you throughout the day, the day today, tomorrow, and Saturday when you come to the conference, but without further ado, here is Lauren Anki, she'll introduce the panel. Thanks, Ira. Good morning, everybody. There he is. Iris seems kind of calm to me somehow. He's uh, really, really, he's got a Zen thing going on. Um, we're really honored to be part of the Ponderosa Stomp again um, as a sponsor and also to really play a big role in the conference. One of the great things that happens um, is that all of these interview sessions are filmed and those will be available in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's library and archives, which will open in Cleveland in January. Um, so it'll be great to have that stuff. The, the kind of lineup that Ira and his whole team have put together uh, in these oral histories and interviews has really been fantastic and it's going to play a major role when we try to kind of make sense of all this music. So uh, it's part of our educational programs at the Rock Hall where we teach all ages about the history of this music and we try to get big stars and in, into the nooks and crannies. So. Um, we're really happy to be participating today. Um, I want to introduce uh, the moderator of our next panel, um, our panel on Bobby Marchand, and this is a great example of linking somebody like Bobby to contemporary music. Allison Fensterstock, who should uh, not be a stranger to any of you, music writer for the Times Picayune, the Oxford American Spin Gambit, uh, helped curate Where They At, uh, the house exhibit at the Ogden Museum, and is currently working on a book on Bounce. So please welcome Allison Fensterstock. So we have some new technology this year. It might take a second to get used to the push buttons. Um, but today we're looking at, I think, one of the most unique personalities in New Orleans music, uh, Mr. Bobby Marchand, who had an influence on sounds here uh, dating from the 40s all the way up into the 90s with hip hop. And we've got some people that knew him through almost all phases of his career. I have uh, on my left, uh, Mr. Wild Wayne Benjamin, who... <laughs> Um, if you live in New Orleans, you'll recognize his voice as kind of being the, the preeminent voice in New Orleans hip hop radio for the past almost 20 years. I don't want to date you. Yeah, it's 20. <laughs> uh, and my right is uh, Mr. Henry Palomino Alexander, who's been promoting music in New Orleans for almost 30 years. And uh, he was Bobby Marchand's business partner for the last decade of his life and started Manicure Records with him. And uh, on her way in is Miss Jerry Hall, who was in uh, Huey Piano Smith's Clowns with Bobby Marchand. They were on the road together from maybe 1958 to 61, and she knew him very well at the Dew Drop Inn where she worked. Um, so I guess considering she's on her way, maybe I can start with Wayne. And uh, can you give us just a, a little perspective on, on Bobby's importance to the hip hop scene as it was starting in the early 90s? Uh, yeah. I personally uh, met Bobby uh, kind of when I first started doing radio, and I started doing radio in 1991. Um, 
I was green, I was in college, uh, and I just remember uh, the first time going up to Bobby's office out in Metairie, uh, it just always kind of brought back memories of that going to see the wizard, you know, because he was this, this long touted guy and you knew all of these different stories about him. I didn't know if when I walked in the office he was gonna be in drag or not. I, I just kind of didn't know what to expect. Um, and, and I knew he had had a ton of success musically. So uh, this was like a big deal for me as, as a fledgling DJ per se. Uh, and I just remember he's sitting behind his desk and the phone just was constantly ringing, ring, 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 and people were always coming to the office. Um, like I said, it was the early 90s, so this was like right at the inception of Bounce. This was right when Cash Money Records was started. This was right when Take Four Records, which is one of the uh, preeminent Bounce labels, they were kind of one of the early, early um, uh, bounce labels that started, but uh, I, I just remember him making a lot of connections outside of the market for artists that were here, namely Cash Money. And I think his importance with Cash Money Records has kind of always been minimized. But you know, he was the the kind of the director. He was the the train conductor that was sending those guys to Detroit and sending them to St. Louis and Phoenix and. Uh, uh, a lot of those areas um, that really were early on Southern music. Um, and, and that was, I think, some of the things that got them out there. So I think his importance, like I said, has been minimized because a lot of folks don't realize how important he was to making cash money uh, what it is. And everybody knows who Lil Wayne is, you know, who, who's uh, huge right now globally. But the seed was planted right there with Bobby Marshall. And I think the, the fantastic thing about it is that his, he was this guy who had had hits in the 60s, he had stayed working with music in the 70s, and all of a sudden he's, I mean, he's still keeping an eye on what the latest trend is. I think, Jerry, do you want to say something about that? I know we talked about his entrepreneurial habits. <laughs> I wasn't involved in the music at the time that Bobby had manicure records. I wasn't in town for a while. Something happened and I had to go and find Bobby. And this is when I found out about manicure records. That's it. That's as much as I knew about it. And um, in talking to him, I find out that he had some artists. And one of his artists was real big at the time. And I was, oh, I was so amazed. And I was so happy for Bobby. I just all aglow. And he says, oh, Miss Jerry, don't go like that. Don't, don't get crazy. I said, all right, I'll be good. <laughs> well, let, let's go back in time then, about 40 years uh, to the Dew Drop Inn on LaSalle Street, and let's talk a little bit about how you first met Bobby. You were living there at the time, right? Yes. I was one of the bar meets at the time. We used to clean the dewdrop, my girlfriend and myself, Teddy. We used to clean the dewdrop, and um, we would wait on the early customers. We'd pack the bar, and we'd have the record box going. Frank would come in, and he'd throw some dollars upon the bar, and he'd say, hmm, keep the music going. All right, Frank. So we just kept the box going. And uh, I'd pack the bar and wait on the customers as they came in. So this day, I was a little bit late getting in, and they had some people sitting at the bar, and I recognized Huey. And Huey says, uh, hey, Jer, how you doing? I said, all right. And Bobby came in, and they were just talking, you know, and I wondered what they were doing. I said, well, you guys got a business meeting here today, huh? Because the, bit, uh, the other guys that sang with them came in. Well not paying any attention to what they were doing. I was just listening to them talking you know, back and forth and the different things they were saying. So uh, I went over to the record box and I played some music. And when I turned to come back, Bobby said, Miss Jerry, he said, you wanna sing, would you sing? If you had an opportunity to sing, would you sing? I said, sure, why? I said, uh, because 
Bobby said, well, because um, he always said, you want to sing with the clowns? I said, sing with the clowns. Bobby started laughing. And uh, I got behind the bar, I didn't pay any attention to him. So he said, really? Bobby said, would you, would you like to sing with the clowns, with the group? I said, yeah, why not, you know? I, I, had, uh, I kind of was struck because nobody had uh, ever approached me about singing. Because I always sing. I sing for myself. It's a part of me to sing. Well, Bobby said, if you're going to sing with us, Miss Jerry, you can go upstairs and pack your things now. And uh, he said, you'd be ready for 9 o'clock because we're leaving here. 9 o'clock. I said, what time is it? 2. You've got plenty of time. It's just 2 o'clock. Go upstairs and pack your things. I said, yeah, I'm going to have to find somebody to keep my, my room for me. Yeah, good. So I went upstairs, packed my things that I was going to take. Don't bring too much junk. All right. <laughs> you know, y'all, y'all got to carry a whole lot of stuff. He would say, yeah, not too much clothes. We can get them on the road. OK. I went upstairs, pulled together a few things. Went back downstairs, made some phone calls. They said, yeah, we'll watch. Oh, you going down the road? Yeah. So Atlanta, Georgia was the first stop. We got to Atlanta about 5 in the morning, next morning. We left here at 11, 11.30. 5 in the morning, we arriving in Atlanta. And that was something else, too. That's another story. Um, just to, to complete it, Pal, why don't you let us know how you met Bobby in the, in the late 80s, that was? Well, I, I met Bobby uh, in the early 60s. I don't know some of y'all said, man, how you met Bobby in the early 60s? He's like a youngster. <laughs> but uh, in the early 60s, I met him. They had a little club uh, in Algier called uh, Redstone. It's a landmark that tore it down. Like, now you know they're doing a uh, medical center. And, uh, you know, we, we talked and things, but later on in the year, like years later, and uh, him and I met by road my studio. A friend of mine named uh, Al, Alfred Taylor had a studio. We were doing a little rap, had a little lowdown bar, rap group, and Bobby came in there, and uh, he said, I sure would like that. that. I said, who is it? I said, that's my little group. I said, well, let me promote that for you. And uh, I'll give it to him. He went to St. Louis. And, uh, came back with the radio and, and you know, getting that on, 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 you know, on the radio station, stuff like that. And so uh, him and I hooked up and we started our little manicure record shop from there, you know. I said, well, give me a name, my Bob. He said, well, uh, what's about manicure? I said, well, that sounds good. Let's, you know, we go for that. And uh, once we started our little record, then we were doing, we doing gone shows by local nightclub, you know do gone shows and stuff like that. So all them artists that come up there and sing, you know, then later on he went to trying to make records and thing. And a lot of time we uh like the the, the, uh, the number one rec uh, singer, something like that, we we take and do a, a contract and make a record, you know. Then a lot of them never went nowhere. But Cash Money came and just to, you know, Cash Money family and uh we went promoting them and they took off, you know rest of history with that. But uh, <clears throat> we did a lot of things, uh, like a lot of artists we are promoted, like Mystical, uh, DJ Jubilee. We also from, uh, promoting, uh, we did a lot of stuff for Mel Waiters, which is doing good in the blues world right now. <clears throat> and uh, Charles Jones. More him, you know, and a host of others, you know, uh, artists that uh, we did a lot of uh, stuff, work with, and, and helped out a lot, you know. Now, Jerry, you were telling me that Bobby also managed most of the the business for the clowns, contracts, and money. Bobby was our manager. <clears throat> Huey is a piano player, but Huey would tell you immediately if you needed to ask any, um, any questions about the business or if you wanted to gig, if you wanted to talk to any of us, you had to go through Huey. And then Bobby would take it over. And I 
he would call us and say, oh, we're going to have such and such a show, or we're going to go and have an interview with such and such a person about 2 or 3 o'clock today. That's enough. And that was as much as, uh, you know, like as much as they allowed us. We, didn't, we weren't allowed to uh, have too much conversations and running around and carrying on. They didn't give us all of that. You, you stayed with the group, and uh, you stayed in the hotel, and everybody knew when you were going and coming. And Bobby took care of all of us. When Bobby began to fold and began to get weak, all of us who were clowns and had worked for Bobby, we were all very ill in the heart because Bobby was really a mainstay of all. all the entertainers that I knew, and Bobby was a mainstay in a very good business advisor. Bobby would sit you down and talk to you and tell you about what you were facing and uh, what you had to do. And I mean, he, he took you around and advised you about everything that you had to do and take care of in the music business. Bobby took care of a lot of people and a lot of groups. They would come and sit and talk to Bobby when uh, we were around the Dewdrop or when we would have uh, a gathering or something that we would talk about. And I used to meet Bobby in the evening in the A&G cafeteria and, uh, no, not A&G, Edwards mm -hmm. on Canal and Broad. And before Bobby could get his dinner and get to sit to the table, we'd have two or three other people coming around to talk to Bobby. I'd say, Bobby, you're really, really popular these days. He says, I'm everybody's business manager, Miss Jerry. Everybody's. He said, I have to advise everybody. I said, good. He said, well, I don't think it's good. He said, because it gets on my nerves and I'm sick. I don't feel like being Bobby. But Bobby, Bobby really lived a good life with the entertainers. He was really New Orleans shot in the arm. He kept us all alive and running here. You know, I want to add to that. Um, obviously, my, my relationship with Bobby was in his later chapters of his life, but it's kind of almost the exact same thing that, that Jerry's saying, like even with the newer hip hop artists, like, and really a lot of the record labels and the heads of those labels, because a lot of them were very inexperienced. Uh, he was about getting artists money and he was serious about it. Uh, I, I just can remember once again, sitting in that office numerous times, hearing them go back and forth with those promoters and club owners and talking about slamming the phone down, they're not coming. They're not coming. They don't want to pay the money. Uh, and they call right back and say, okay, we're gonna wire you the money, you know? But uh, it was like, it really was a loss, especially at the point where hip hop in New Orleans was really starting to gain a lot of ground because there weren't many experienced managers and still aren't a whole lot of experienced managers in this market. Um, additionally, he had, looks like, the conduit to a lot of other areas and executives where he could just pick up the phone and call and make things happen. Mm -hmm. And um, you don't really see a lot of that now because there's tons of talent <laughs> in New Orleans, whatever genre of music it may be, but I think that's our biggest problem is we don't have really stand-up guys that are about getting money and stand-up guys that are about uh, creating that conduit to the New Yorks or Maybe it's the Atlantas or maybe it's the LAs. We're kind of missing that. And Bobby really, if uh, that's the one thing, if, if maybe he would have groomed that one person to come after him, maybe tie some of those connections, I, I think we'd be even further along because we have more talent block by block than anywhere in the nation. I think it's amazing when you, when you think about it, you take a, a billion dollar musical empire like Young Money Entertainment and you could make a case saying that that would never have existed without Bobby. I, I really think some of, you know, a lot of people down Baby, who was the head of Cash Money, but I think the streets that Baby dealt with, coupled with Bobby Marsh and Savvy about getting his money, I think formed the person that he is into that, that enormous uh, unit, you know, a billion dollar company. You get a million dollar show right now, and they got a date till the end of the yeah. year. So I, I really think like, that, that bulldog uh, uh, characteristic that Baby has, I, I think it might, in some ways, be formulated from Bobby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure has. I think just 
suit seems to be the right time now. I have a recording um, from an artist that I had wanted to invite to be on this panel, Tim Smooth, who was a, a rapper that Bobby worked with very early on. And unfortunately, he passed away uh, last month. But I have an excerpt from an interview I did with him about Bobby last year. So I'm going to see if I can make this technology work and play that. First person ever paid me fifteen hundred dollars to come rap in front of some people. Bust my dome. He was the first. Bobby did the gong shows and he would let us come out and just sing us, rap us, dance us. Come on, the Mr. Sister. Mr. Sister. And he'll come out with a dress on. <laughs> yeah. He was not a drag queen, he was a moth. He was a he was gay. And he was openly powerful with it, because he would bust your ass for playing with him about being a punk, trust me. So you had to respect him, you know. We, we love Bobby. Bobby was, look, Bobby was the first person that ever called me and said, come to my office. I walk in the office, he gave me $1,500. I was like, what is this for? He said, you got two shows. This is your down payment. You're going to get the other 15 when you get to the places. And he taught me what was going on. He taught baby in cash money what was going on. But he t even the people who didn't like each other, we would meet up, walking in and out of Bobby's office. He would get you ready to play in spots that you were like, you know, damn, how you do that, Bobby? Bobby made this shit happen. In real life, at least, kicked it off. Oh, yeah. Bobby kicked it off for us. Trust me, I'm telling you. Bobby called those radio stations, and, and nothing was funnier than when you asked him, Bobby, how do you got the people to play my record? He straight up and said, what well, I do on my own time, Tim Smooth, is not your damn thing. <laughs> so nobody messed with him for Fuck no, he had a, uh, he was a green beret. I would have knocked you out, man. Ain't nothing worse than get beat up by a fag. I'm telling you, one on one, too. I hope that was audible. Um, and that kind of brings us to another aspect of Bobby's personality. Jerry, what, let me know, what, what was Bobby doing when he first moved here? Bobby is not uh, what you would call a, what they call that belt that they give boxers? Bobby was a boxer. Y'all know, nobody knows that, nobody said anything. When Bobby was young, before he started the, into the music, he was a finished boxer. Yeah. I heard that from Huey and, and uh, uh, Rudy Ray Moore, because Rudy Ray Moore was a boxer, and he was, that's how he and Bobby became friends, because they used to spar together. I heard that in Baton Rouge. How's that? <laughs> and uh, when, when Bobby first moved to New Orleans uh, from Ohio, he was also a female impersonator at the time? She's talking about Bobby's um, groups. Bobby had dance groups. He had female impersonator shows. And he had approximately 16 different entertainers and performers. They would sing and they would dance and they would come out one by one and do a show. And they, if they were going to sing, they would sing a song and they would dance. Then he had uh, a couple of snake dancers and he had a couple of shake dancers and all of them were excellent. You couldn't work for Bobby if you weren't good. I have to tell you, Bobby was a number one. We all miss Bobby and everybody in the entertainment world is gonna miss him because they're gonna have to find another Bobby to get it off the ground in New Orleans again. Now, during the, the 50s and 60s, the female impersonator shows were very popular. Yes, very much so. It was one of the only entertainment venues we had here. The dancers, the female impersonators, and the dancers. That was it. That was one of the only things we had. Let's see. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about any of that until I went out in the world. 
but I knew, like, I, I suffer with asthma a lot. And I used to go to Charity Hospital to get shots. And sometime after they picked me up, the guys wanted to get a drink. They had to go and find the bars. So we'd go on Rampart Street, and we'd see pictures of Bobby and his dancers on the walls. I'd say, who is that? Because I'm always interested in music. Bobby Marchand, Bobby Marchand, and uh, this one and that one. I said, well, when do they come in town? They'll put the dates up whenever they're going to arrive. They put the dates up around with the pictures. And that's how I knew about Bobby and his dancers. But I would be full of asthma medicine. I would be out of it. <laughs> but, I, but everybody was, you know, the pictures were on the wall. They had this, these little, um, what you would call them? these boxes that they build like a frame and they put the, um, the pictures inside the framework to advertise it. Bobby had a good number of dancers and they were all good. They took me out one night on Friday and to see Bobby's show and uh, I was amazed and Bobby was the master of ceremonies and Bobby used to change his costume every time he got ready to come out and announce some next dancer. Rarely did Bobby keep the same clothes on. He would always change, and he had a thousand wigs. I must tell you. Now, uh, I, I guess he did take some, some time off from being a female impersonator during his singing career, but I, Wayne and, and Pal, I think he, he went back to it when he started doing the gong doing shows. The gong show. yeah, he, uh, he, went, he went back to... Uh, no female impersonator makeup when he went doing the gong show and um, and he's he's a hell of a comedian. Yeah. And uh, when you're on that stage you better not tell him nothing. Cause you got some you got something to tell you, you know. Yeah, no hecklers allowed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. He was gonna have a reply real quick. Real quick, sure, you know. Sure. So, yeah. And don't sit on the front row. I'm not going to say all the things that he said, but you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, yeah, see, now he was on, we had, we had, we had, we had, we had, we had a concert, we had, we had did, uh, we did Betty Wright and uh, Marvin Sheep, God bless the day, you know. and Bobby had, this guy, you know, doing that kidney thing, he had to get another van, and uh, one of them guys, you know, that know, Bobby. You know, how you broke your arm, you know, what you doing your arm in the cash? I ram it up, <laughs> bah, bah, bah. So, uh, <laughs> you sit, one, one lady sitting there, he said, he told her, baby, say, uh, you can close your legs, I'm watching your old man. You know, <laughs> stuff like that. He was, <laughs> he was very funny, you know, he was, he was a young man. Yeah, and I think, Jerry, you told me a story about him cutting up when you were on the road. Oh, we were in North Carolina, Kinston, North Carolina, and it was an Air Force base out there. No, a Marine base. It's a Marine base. One is across the river from the other. Well, we had a show, and uh, we did the show, and it was nice. That was the first night, and, it, and everybody was calm. Everybody was real nice. And nobody did, and I look at Bobby and say, Bobby, no flirting. Oh, Mr. Jerry, leave me alone. He said, I don't see nothing out there I want anyway. I either want to talk to it. So that was fine. A couple of days passed, we go to the, we have the next show, we cross the river, go to the next show. We were having a good time. I mean, we were having a party that night because it looks like everybody and his brother had come out to see the show because it wasn't too much, like, uh, too much playing around at the other show, but this one, Everybody was there. I mean, they were having a ball. That night passed. Bobby had about, oh, a parade of people coming and going in that room, and he was right across the hall from me. So I, you know, I, I had been sick because I had, uh, we had, uh, we had just left Baltimore, and I, had, I had gotten uh, this pneumonia that they had, the Hong Kong flu. And I wasn't too well. I didn't do too much, so I stayed in my room. Well, I heard Bobby and, and uh, the people, and they were having a good time over there. And after a while, it got real quiet. And I think 
made the I dozed halfway, dozed off to sleep. And I, oh, oh, oh. I jumped out the bed and I ran to the door and I opened up the door and door, Bobby had his door open. And the water was flying all through the air. Bobby had sat on the, on the, um, uh, no, it's, it's a uh, face bowl. The face bowl was right by the door. And Bobby had hit the face bowl and broke the face bowl off the wall and hit the pipes and the pipe, the water was, he said, call the manager, quick, call the manager. It was hilarious. That was hilarious because Bobby was laughing himself. And we had water all in the hall, all in his room, all on the wall, all in my room. I said, Bobby, how did you, pushing this has to be out of my room, trying to make him leave. <laughs> I said, Bobby, you, you, he said, well, we had a good enough time. We all been playing and drinking. Everybody left here drunk. This one don't want to leave. I'm pushing him out the door and knocked the baseball off the wall. This man is going to charge me a fortune to fix this. I said, well, you always having your parties. Oh, shut up, Miss Jerry, and get the manager. Hurry up. That was the end of that. And I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that, I mean, for so long he could be so out as a gay man in the music business and really not get any static for it in New Orleans. Is Very curious about that myself. I mean, because it was a different time then. Uh, and it was accepted, <clears throat> like, just very curious. Bobby Marchand was a gentleman, par excellent. You did not speak out of turn to Bobby. When Bobby was sober and taking care of business, that's what he did. And he carried himself like a normal person. He did not carry himself, oh, I'm gay, oh, he didn't, he did not blunt that. He was just always a gentleman. And when he was dealing with you, he dealt with you like person to person. He didn't, uh, I'm this, you, you gotta act like this with me, or none of that. He just was normal human being, except he was uh, homosexual, as they call him. Bobby wasn't uh, bluesy because he was homosexual. He was none of that. He was just a normal homosexual. And in later years, from some things that I had seen and had talked about with Bobby, in later years, after studying life and being around different things, reading the Bible, you read about the eunuchs that are in the world. And I'll believe it until I die that Bobby was a eunuch. Because he, he didn't carry himself like he was an abnormal person. He was always well respected. Everybody respect Bobby. Everybody. The young ones, the old ones, the business people, the entertainers, they all gave Bobby great respect. He just did not carry himself like he was out of the ordinary, any kind of way. Not Bobby. Well, uh, you know, you, you, you never know that Bobby gave unless he put his wig on and makeup. That's right. You know, but see, Long, him and I have been part of this stuff, you know, doing the, uh, every, like I said, like, it's like, uh, I say, everybody respect him, you know. And Mr. some call him Mr. Bob. You know. Hey, Mr. Bob, my friend, you know. And the youngsters, all the little rappers, they, they respect him, you know. I never heard nobody got out the, you know, got out the way with him, I call him, you know, out his name yeah. or something. No, uh -uh, he just, he, like you said, he was a business person, you know, and everything was business. I know, and back during the days of the clowns, you, you had some, some of the most sort of flamboyant people in New Orleans come through that band, if I'm not mistaken. You had Little Richard and James Booker and Escarita. So there was a lot of personality going on. You're talking about another set in another group of, uh, not we're not gay, and not, uh, we are not who we are, and we're not this or that as entertainers. All of them were gay, and all of them act. Some of them had this, had it in them to be flamboyant, like Lil' Richard is definitely a flamboyant gay. And Lil' Richard will tell you that, he will show you that, 
and he will portray it for you. This is who Richard was. But Richard used to be with us, and we'd have parties you would not believe. We would just eat and drink and clown and have a good time. That's how I got into clowns, because of them. And because I was always with them and always having a good time. Now, Escarita, he was another one. When, when Escarita, the only way you could tell Escarita was gay because he'd have his hair tied up. But he'd put on a suit and uh, he would go to take care of his business. It wasn't all of that, no. Uh -uh. They all kept themselves well. And Booker, little Booker, another one. Really, really, really excellent pianist. Knew how to teach you how to sing could know how to make you sing. If you didn't know how and your people wanted you to sing, Booker knew how to take you as a, as a person and give you lessons, voice lessons. I watched him do that with a few people. Booker knew how to get you up to the piano next to him and hit the notes and coax you to hit those notes, coax you to sing. Booker did that with a few people that had been very popular. Nobody might not know it, but I was right there. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to see him do it. Excellent pianist. He had, um, this is something that, that Booker did. Uh, we were all uptown on the, on the South Street in the restaurant. It was around, I'd say about three o'clock in the evening one day. And it was school time, around this time of the year, and Booker was at college, and he was taking a, he was taking a course in music, a couple of them. And he walks, he walks in the restaurant, and he's got about nine books in his arms, and he drops them on the table. I said, Booker, where are you going with all these books? He says, I got to prove to this bitch that I know as much about music as she does, <laughs> and I have to read these books. I said, Booker, really, you, he said, sure, I'm gonna make sure that she does not talk down to me the next time we go in class together. And that's how Booker was. I said, you gonna read those books? Every one of them, Miss Jerry, every one. That was Booker. Could play anything. Sounds like the, the clowns might have been the most fun band in town. <laughs> yeah, we had a good time, a very good time. Everybody acted out on the stage. We did, we had about, um, I would say, in our show we had about 10 tunes we would do. And uh, we had four tunes that were, hmm, there were other people's, other, other artists' tunes, and um, we would carry on. We had all our own things, we had our own parts. You know, like we'd, make, we'd, we'd take a break from one part of the tune to another part, and you would dance, you had your own dance. And we would just go dancing from one thing to the next thing. We each did, we, we each come out in the stage and do our own little skit. And my thing was to dance with one of the other guys that I sang with. We we do us a dance together, and everybody stand back one by one and come out and do their steps. And that was one of the that was one of our best things. Then we would sing our own tunes and we do rock and pneumonia and uh, don't you just know it? And uh, we had uh, high blood pressure, but those tunes came later. They didn't come when we first started performing. But regardless of that, we had enough tunes to carry on real bad on the stage. And we'd light up the house, have everybody dancing in the aisles. And what, don't you just know it in High Blood Pressure was the first clowns record that Bobby sang on, is that right? I was saying the uh, Don't You Just Know It and High Blood Pressure record, that was the first one that Bobby sang on the recording of. And I don't, I'm not sure, I don't know about that. 
because see, I wasn't around the group when they made the first records, like um, Rockin' New Morning. I don't think Papa was on there. I don't think he was on that. But I do know that um, we put we put high blood pressure we put high blood pressure together, and uh, don't you just know it? Those who are we we were going from. Washington, D.C. to Baltimore to do a gig. And we were riding on the expressway. And he would say, Roosevelt, listen to this. We also had Rudy Ray Moore with us at the time. He was driving for us. And that's how the song got its name, Don't You Just Know It. Because that was one of Rudy Ray Moore's favorite sayings, Don't You Just Know It, child. And um, he's driving, and he started making Bobby sing the um, High of the Mountain, Cool of the Breeze. And he, said, he pointed at Roosevelt and said, don't you just know it. And then uh, he said, Miss Jerry, I want you to do this. And then you and Roosevelt do it together. And a uh, younger the couple, tighter the squeeze. And uh, they said, don't you just know it. And oh boy, it went from one verse of that tune to the next verse. We didn't record all of the stuff that was done for uh, Don't You Just Know It. We don't, we didn't. But it, we, it, was re it wasn't recorded, it was pieced together while we were on that going to, going to the gig and coming back from the gig, we were singing it, getting it together. And, and Huey was pointing it out. And Bobby laughed. <laughs> we were just having a good time. Now when we got back to the hotel, Bobby says, we're going to leave tomorrow, y'all. We're going back to New Orleans to record. I said, so that's why y'all was putting that together last night. Yes, Miss Jerry. That's why we were getting it together. So on the way to New Orleans, they said, well, you know, uh, that's just one tune. We got to do something else. And uh, Bobby hollered, I get a high blood pressure when you call my name. And that was the beginning of high blood pressure. And we put that one together, coming to New Orleans. And when we got here, we went right in the studio and recorded them. And they were big hits immediately. And Paula, when you started working with Bobby, he was still recording his own songs a little bit we, as, uh, as well. We, uh, we, uh, we called we call up uh, Clarence, yeah, we call Clarence called him and said, well, Big Clarence, you know, Bobby, what Bobby called him, see. They said, Bobby, what are you, Bobby, how you doing? The man said, uh, me and my uh, manager, said, we are uh, going to do a uh, stroking, your rep, he said. Hmm. Bobby, go ahead, do what you want, you know. So we recorded and uh, we did good, but we saw a lot of them by the famous doing the Frank for us. We saw a lot of uh, tapes. And, uh, that was the last recording he made. And he got sick after that. Actually, I have a Bobby's version of Stroke in here, if you want to hear a little bit of it. I think the, he puts a special mm -hmm. Bobby Marchand stamp on it. No. 
take on stroke and which I was actually just talking to Wayne about that outside that uh, calling out the names of the different projects is something that almost immediately came up right afterwards in bounce music that might be the earliest song I've ever heard that in yeah we were uh, actually just talking about that kind of the early call and response type deal and calling out the wards or the project areas I, I think quite easily could have been like the precursor for bounce music. And uh, I, I know the subtitle of this panel actually is Booty Green. Uh, there's some lyrics in that song that kind of almost have a bounce feel to it if you kind of analyze it a little bit. So it is really interesting that uh, the bounce movement per se, and then some of uh, uh, the artists that Bobby was promoting and, and doing some management with were early bounce artists. You gotta wonder if there was some backdoor conversations where he was uh, giving up some lyrics for the songs even. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. You might be able to expound on that, pal. Did, did that ever happen? You know, mm -hmm. Did he ever give him any tips on, no, on creating their songs? No, he never gave him no tip like that. No? You know, he just, he just uh, helped a lot um, somehow to handle his business and you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. But. Um, I don't know, you might have went behind my back and did those tips, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's really also interesting, especially when you talk about uh, the transgender performances, right. how open they were, and then even now when you have uh, a big Frida, Sissy Nobi, and uh, additionally, um, uh, like Baca, and yeah, right. uh, oh, I'm leaving out, Katie Red. Uh, you just also have to wonder if any of these things would have ever been able to happen in another city other than New Orleans. Because it's really, I always am amazed by some of the people uh, that are from here that have been openly gay or transgender and been accepted. I, I don't know how many people knew that RuPaul's from New Orleans, that Ellen DeGeneres is from New Orleans. Uh, a lot of folks that Patsy maybe- Patsy Vidalia. Uh, yeah, would maybe have never been able, had been able to I don't know, Patsy. Uh, but tell me about them. <laughs> uh, maybe would never have been able to uh, achieve their status if they were from another city. Right. <laughs> We've got about 10 minutes left. Are there any questions? Getting the microphone from. Hello? Yeah. All right, Tessa. This is for any of you. Did Bobby ever t t tell you how he came up with those crazy monologues and there's something on your mind? You know, this aside was like, whether you just see your wife, you know, with another man, you decide to shoot her too, you know, that part. Did anyone, he ever talk to any of you how he came up with those crazy monologues? The only thing I know about there's something on your mind is that I don't know whether Bobby wrote that or Larry Donnell. There was a, a female impersonator here. Um, his name was Larry Donnell. He's talking about a beautiful human. He was beautiful, good looking, and smooth, suave. <laughs> very, very smooth. I think that uh, he wrote that. Bobby did it second. Bobby did uh, There's Something on Your Mind after Larry Donnell did it. Larry Donnell used to sing at the Dewdrop. He's Patsy Bedelia's cousin. We have another one here, unsung uh, transgender beings. Patsy Bedelia. Now, I don't know, I don't remember Patsy's real name, but Patsy lived up on um, Britannia Street near Napoleon Avenue, him and his mom. And uh, his mom was getting along in age when I came around the Dewdrop. But I met Larry Donnell because I did my first show with Larry Donnell. 
the first singing that I did on stage as a professional was with Larry. He took me with a group called Lil Millet. Um, I've forgotten the name of the group. Anyway, I sang my first songs with, with uh, Lil Millet and the Creoles, that's what it was. And um, Larry Donnell was the head of the show. He was the one who put the show together. We went through Texas and up and over off of Louisiana. And then we came back home. And in about six, seven months, that's when I got my job with the, with the clowns. But now Patsy, Patsy was the MC to the Dewdrop. And Patsy used to dress out and sing and, let me see, what was that you used to sing? I'm going up on the mountain to face the rising sun. If I find anything good, I'm going to bring my good man some. Because I'm a hip-shaking mama. And I love to judge a brown so slow. Well, he used to be yours, but he won't be yours anymore. Now, this was Patsy's number. And he opened the dewdrop with that, all the shows. Patsy sang that. And that was how I knew Patsy. But he and Larry Donnell were cousins, and that's as much as I knew about their relationship. But they were very good, and they kept the dewdrop alive until Bobby came. I think Patsy actually gave that song to Irma Thomas to do eventually. Irma had said, yeah. She said that she didn't do all the lyrics, but Patsy did. Patsy had his own set of lyrics sometime. Uh, I thought I knew a lot about Bobby Marchand, but uh, I'm from Ohio. I didn't know he was from Ohio. Did, so any of the four of you know uh, where well, he was raised up? Young, Youngstown, Ohio. Yeah. All right. He had a pretty brownstone in Youngstown. Real pretty. <clears throat> Real pretty brownstone. His mom's house was beautiful. Jerry, this is off subject, but what was it like to be a Ray up? Hilarious, you guys. That was a hilarious gig. <laughs> Hard, because Ray Charles is very strict, and you have to, you, when you get on the stage and sing with Ray Charles, you have been well schooled and well rehearsed. And you don't make any mistakes, you don't run all over the place, you don't jump off the stage, you don't holler and scream. You're a lady. You have to be a lady working with Ray Charles. I think uh, later this afternoon, Jerry's on another panel where she's going to, I think, talk more about that. Is that at, at four? Yeah. At four. So come back. <laughs> okay, can I pick up on your comment about Escarita? There's so little written about the guy. And one of the questions would be how influential was Escarita? in New Orleans during his time. Did people turn out in big numbers to see him? And do you have any other stories uh, about your um, working with Escarita on the same stage when you maybe saw him live? I never worked with Escarita, but Escarita was, um, Escarita was lucky because Escarita, after Huey, after Huey had been calling all the performers out, the girl singers and ladies who sing background with Huey. Escarita came in town to record. Uh, Escarita had a song called What's Behind the Green Door. Made a big hit, big hit. Escarita uh, called together all the young ladies who could really sing and they are um, They all did background for SQ. They recorded his stuff, and we weren't in town. I wasn't anywhere near. I just know about what he was doing. And the girls talked about it. And um, one of the girls, I can't, one of his lead singers, she died. I was living next door to a couple of doors from her when she died. She was in a wheelchair. Her boy was taking care of her. But she talking about could sing. This one could sing. But Huey and nobody would let her sing um, solo 
because she was too good. She, was, she had a blues, she had a heavy voice, was heavy in mind, and she would sing blues. Now, a young man just came in, he might know her, he might have played with her when we weren't here, but um, she, she never did uh, make it big. And I can't tell what her name is, but we, we really had a lot of young women around the city that were, were good vocalists. But they were, they were up front vocalists, they were lead vocalists. They weren't background singers. Huey knew a lot of them. I didn't, I just knew about them. And um, Escarita has a record called What's Behind the Green Door? I don't know what has happened to it because it's somewhere here and he had, I can see one of them in my head. I don't know what happened to them. They just dispersed. Oh, I believe that uh, this girl, Mr. Bell, I think Mr. Bell is on with it, one of these programs. She sang with Escarita a while too. Carol Fran was in the in the archives at that time. All those ladies were here in New Orleans, but I was on the road with Ray Charles. So I, I never had a chance to really get a chance to meet all of them. But for a few times, I had a chance to talk to them. And they sang here in New Orleans. Now where and how much and with who, I don't know. But we had, we had a lot of uh, good, talented ladies here. Where they are now, I don't know. And SQ just disappeared. I don't know where he went. Hey, it's, uh, I, I, I'm uh, happy to have this opportunity to talk to you because I have a question. Now, I grew up in Youngstown in the early 70s, and my parents had the Popeye single from Ace. And I was wondering how they acquired that. And then it was only two months ago that I learned about Bobby Marchand and that he was from Youngstown. And um, I was curious if you guys had like that wide of a distribution on, on on your singles and were that popular, or if that was a direct connection to Bobby's hometown, and if he, you guys actually traveled to Youngstown um, and had the red carpet rolled out for you there for him, and uh, or traveled with the records, or um, so I guess my question is, did, did you guys like travel with the records and, and visit Youngstown often, or his hometown, or did he have a connection there still when he was in the Clowns? I can't answer that because I wasn't involved with the clowns at the time. But I do know Huey wrote the Popeye off of uh, some gig that they went on. I'm not sure. I don't know. I just know that when, when uh, <coughs> later years, when I asked for a tape, I had, we were going to, uh, Pittsburgh, we're going to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to do the gong, a gong show where Bob, there was no one available to go. I was the only one beside uh, Hudson, our trumpet player. And Bobby and myself and uh, Hudson, we went up to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and we did. They have tapes on this, just we have never seen them. But that was the only, that was the only thing that, uh, only, you know, we did the Popeye then. I never have talked to Bobby or Huey about where did they come up with that, you know, <coughs> and how they came up. I just knew that we did the dance. The, oh, Eugene, one of the guys that was in the group, he knew something about that. Him and, uh, him and Roosevelt, because it was dance called the Popeye. And I think that Bobby and, and Huey wrote that tune around that dance. That's as much as I know about it. I think we might be out of time unless there's maybe one more question out there. Oh, Mr. Blacktop. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering about the uh, choreography uh, from the shows where uh, Bobby started out uh, where he was MC and up to the clowns and on, on through 
like did he teach you dance steps or anything like that to do with the clowns and and yes he would put together some uh, what what do you want to do he would say what would you like to put in here what what kind of dance you want to do here and uh, we would do just some normal time steps and then we'd make breaks and do our own little skit, like I said in the very beginning. But we did have uh, we did have three tunes that we had uh, choreography on. I can't I can't think of the name of the song right now. Don't you just know it, where it's falling off the stage? And no, no, it wasn't like that. Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was one of the songs from another group. Hey la, hey la, ya, 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 ya. Well, that's the only one that we did uh, choreography on and that he taught us and we had time steps. We all do the same thing. That's the only one. And um, blood pressure, no. The only ones I did with him was um, uh, the first two. That first time, he, uh, don't you, no, the first, no, that's the first thing. Rock and pneumonia, that's it. We had, a, we had a choreography on that. That was it, you know, we didn't, they didn't, you couldn't ever get Huey to dance, now look, I'm tell you. There's no such thing as dancing for Huey Smith. Huey said, I play. That's all, I play. Don't try to make me dance, I play. Because Dick Clark tried to make him dance. He said, why don't you get up and do a step, Huey? Huey said, no man, I play. All I do is play. We can do one more, right? Is, it, is that Larry Darnell the same one of uh, For You, My Love? It was a big hit. All right, I think we're out of time. It would probably take maybe 20 more people to even try to define everything that Bobby did for New Orleans music. But um, thank you to uh, Wild Wayne, uh, Henry Palomino, Alexander, and of course, uh, Miss Jerry Hall. For coming. <laughs>